Hey guys, we're here for our next session. Uh, we have Jack here, head of partnerships at Wire. Uh, he's gonna do a talk on how to use Wire's API for compliance and payments. And I'll let him take it from here. If you guys can just confirm in the chat, you can hear him, that would be great. And Jack, you might want to start talking. <laughs> awesome, hey guys, um, I guess I should present first. Uh, let's see, let's see. Talk a video here. Are you guys able to see? Awesome. Um, cool. I'll just get started then. Um, uh, I'm Jack. I am head of partnerships at Wire. I've been with the company since day one, and uh, it's been six years since we've been kind of in the crypto industry and seen a lot of changes uh, over the years. It's a very exciting time, you know, at the dawn of this next bull run. So yeah, so I'll just jump into how you can use Wire. Um, just a little history first, I guess. Um, so we were incubated by Boost VC in 2013. Um, at that time, it was you know kind of the first bull run where Bitcoin broke twelve hundred dollars, and there was a lot of new kind of crypto rich people that wanted to spend it to buy cups of coffee or other mining equipment, etc. So it was sort of a crypto to fiat flow that we had initially built out. We became an MSP pretty early on, uh, and just started building out all the payout infrastructure that was necessary to you know go from uh, let's say BTC to US dollar and Mexican peso, Brazil and real. Yeah, so that's how we kind of started in 2013. Uh, it was very, very fun early days. Definitely uh, very different nowadays. But um, you know, I think in 2015 we realized that uh, we had to start onboarding new users to the ecosystem. So we actually started building out the fiat on ramp portion. You know, you can imagine for crypto payments for fiat off ramps, it's going from you know crypto in fiat out. But for for a wallet uh, that requires you know onboarding an end user so they can start buying. Crypto, uh, it requires some KYC AML and connecting their traditional payment methods. Um, and you know, that would allow for a fiat on ramp going from fiat to crypto. So, you know, having done both on ramps and off ramps in 2017, we basically kind of pivoted to start doing cross border payments using crypto as a rail by combining the two. And you can imagine how that might look, right? So in traditional FX payments, you're going from let's say US dollar to Chinese Yuan, and you would go through uh, Swift uh, using some sort of FX provider in the traditional sense to convert US dollar to CNY. Uh, using crypto as a rail, you're effectively converting US dollar to a crypto such as Bitcoin, and then you're sending that Bitcoin to another jurisdiction and converting it to local currency uh, locally in that market. So from doing that, it was, uh, very, it was it was very much more complex, I would say, than just doing on ramps by itself or off ramps by itself, because you had to aggregate a lot of liquidity across different venues, so different exchanges on uh, in, in different markets, right? Bitstamp in Europe or Coinbase in US or you know Huobi and OKCoin in China and Bitso in Mexico. So we ended up aggregating a lot of liquidity from all these different venues on how we route orders, um, and also throughout the years we had to. Because we were moving money uh, in, in this kind of custodial manner, right, where a user gives us US dollars, we uh, then process it to uh, some other currency in uh, this new way. We were basically taking possession of the user's funds. Uh, and in doing so, we had to become a licensed money transmitter. So currently in the US, we're federally regulated as an MSB and also hold money transmission licenses from state to state. Now, we don't have all the licenses because uh, they're rather expensive. Um, you know, for example, the state of New York with the bid license is and requires a few million dollars in surety bonds just to take out a money transmitter license in New York. So we're not licensed there just yet. Um, but you know, across every jurisdiction where we operate, we're either licensed ourselves or we are uh, working with locally licensed partners. Um, there's a fair fair amount of nuance, I would say, you know, with compliance in each country, obviously, but you can kind of all come down to just the KYC and the AML, the transaction monitoring, making sure you know to check OFAC and all these different uh, blacklisted restriction countries where individuals, uh, and just making sure that you're moving money in a compliant manner. Right. So so far, you know, we've only kind of talking about the fiat side and just the regulations that are necessary for intaking or outtaking fiat payments. Anyways, you know, all of this has been now kind of built and aggregated into one API by wire to you know, kind of deal with the legacy financial system, if you will, right? It's, uh, it, it's, it's such a kind of 
you know, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole when, you know, we're all building really exciting tech on chain, you know, DeFi is so much easier to deal with, I would argue, you know, as far as just using technology purely to move money. Uh, whereas you know, the on-ramp or the off-ramp portion is not as fun, but, but it's necessary to kind of bring on the next 100 million users. Uh, how do we onboard them, whether they're institutions, whether they're just end users, you know, John and Jane, and going from either their card or their bank to, uh, to, to the blockchain. And, you know, having, once you're on the blockchain, obviously, we can you know, do a lot more in terms of on-chain interactions. But just having that initial on-ramp and off-ramp is what Wire has built. Um, yeah, so, so I think it'd be good to just kind of go through an example of how Wire's transfer API works. Right, so this is uh, kind of you know a very simple way to think of it is there's always a transfer going from some sort of source to some sort of desk, right? So, so for example, when you're going from you know let's say your bank account, which is denominated in U.S. dollars, right, and you're trying to send money to uh, to another user, right? You you basically have to specify a certain amount of you know what you're purchasing versus the desk currency that you're sending it to so us dollar to eth for example right 100 us dollars to 0.5 eth let's call it right and then a destination address for where you might send that so when you construct a wire when you, when you cons when you construct a transfer using the uh, wire api you're always you know giving us some sort of source and some sort of dust and you know a user a and user b might have different um, source and desk because you know the, the if if I'm a if, if I'm Jack in the U.S. and I'm sending money to Ronaldo in Brazil, right? I have already onboarded. You know, I, will, I will basically be onboarding two users through this kind of marketplace API, if you will. In in the traditional sense, it, you can think of it as a marketplace API because just kind of like how Stripe Connect works, you know, uh, Uber or Lyft is intaking money from an end user and is paying out to a driver. Right. In the same way, you can do that with Wire, um, but, but for crypto, right? So, so you will still take the KYC and AML of both users, right? And you will specify kind of their account details, right? Their name, date of birth, address, uh, payment information, such as bank details or their card information, right? And you, you will take that for both user A and user B. And then you'll be able to, let's say, you know, debit a certain amount from user A, uh, $100, convert it to 100 USDC, let's say, Right, send to a destination that belongs to that user B's uh, wire account. Not, 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 not in terms of uh, sending it to their wire account with uh, within wire, but sending it to the de deposit address that equals that user B's account. Right. So because this is all on chain, right? Where we're trying to do this from off chain to on chain, and then on chain back to off chain. So you know, once you have already created the user A and B, you're basically able to move the money around. The world using blockchain and then kind of off ramping it to user B's accounts. So, for example, here, uh, populating that example with, you know, Jack sending money to Ronaldo in Brazil. All right. So, the source currency might be US dollar, desk currency is Brazilian real, source amount is $100,000. Uh, right. There's a destination which is some sort of payment method ID. Uh, and then user B will proceed to receive that and using wires transfer API, we're able to basically route the order from US dollar to something like a USDC, right? The USDC goes through, let's say Coinbase, uh, and then from Coinbase, let's say to Foxbits in Brazil, uh, convert USDC to BRL, pay out to user B. And this can be done within an hour or less actually, uh, from end to end, from one user's bank to another. Right, so this is just like one use case to highlight them all because we're going from uh, on ramp to off ramp, but it really encompasses all any any other use case, right? So, for example, if you're a merchant processor that wants to intake crypto and just going from USDC or Dai to a merchant, let's say let's say USB is a business and you're paying out uh, to their bank account because you've already helped them to process payments from crypto and you now need to cash them out. Right. Well, it's the same API because the source and the dust can be specified pretty much as anything. The source here is user A, but it could have been user B's in uh, user B's crypto payment wallet that intakes the crypto and converts it to fiat. 
Um, or, you know, let's say you're a wallet and you wanted to help different users to get on board, you know, you will be able to intake the fiat from different payment methods, such as cards and debit cards or Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay, uh, and convert it to USDC and deposit it to the desk, which would be their, uh, their own wallet address, let's say. Right, so it really encompasses a lot of different use cases and what you can do. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so that, oh, sorry, this slide is the same one. Yeah, so, you know, looking at it more programmatically here, you know, you'll be passing us the KYC AML of an individual or business, depending on the use case once again, right? And some of their KYC, along with payment method information down here. Um, and yeah, you would just kind of hit our API and instruct us to pull money from one user uh, and do something with it on chain, either through a meta proxy or any other kind of uh, smart contracts or smart contract wallets. Um, and, and that's the portion where any team can do anything with that, right? And then when you need to off ramp, you know, we actually allow for attaching a blockchain address to a user such that you have an on chain manner of interacting with a bank account. And what I mean is, is you know, let's say you create user B here, right? Where this user now has an SRN on wire. Well, if you attach a blockchain address to this user, and every time you send funds to this address, then it will auto liquidate back to fiat and send it to that user's uh, bank account, right? So, so th that's that allows you to basically, um, you know, have a purely on chain manner of interacting with something completely off chain, because we have tied, uh, we have tied a bank account that's off chain to a crypto address that's on chain, and any funds sent to that on chain address auto liquidates to that fiat payment method. Cool, yeah, so that's, you know, that, that's pretty much um, all I had to say about that is, you know, we're we're always trying to get ahead in, in, in payments and where we're going. And there's a lot that we can do because we've been in the space for six years now, we understand where payments is going. And we really do think that, um, you know, going forward, especially for retail users, it makes a lot of sense to just use um, the devices, native payment methods such as Apple Pay and Google Pay, Obviously, you can you know use a lot of different payment methods like ACH or SEPA, um, but from from user experience standpoint, I personally do think that it makes a lot of sense for a lot of teams to just use these payment methods uh, because they're more secure. It's using the secure enclave on a user's phone to store their card information. It's always encrypted from end to end. Um, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's definitely something where. Uh, it's a very powerful API that can be used for a lot of different use cases by a lot of different teams. Uh, and just looking at kind of where we currently service and where all the different end users are based. All right, this is very simple, rough map, but uh, once again, you know, a lot of users originate from all over the world uh, and they all have some sort of different use case. Uh, in our case, obviously, it all has to do with uh, remittance and payments, uh, crypto merchant processing, uh, fiat RMs for wallets, uh, and uh, you know the remittance use case is a, a, a huge one. I would argue for what crypto has already proven that it can do. Um, so you know different teams using our API to either create custodial wallets in in some cases when they're MSB, or if they're already a non-custodial wallet and they need the on-ramp and off-ramps uh, to support their local users. Yeah, and this is just basically an idea that we had for different teams and what they can do with Wires API because, you know, as far as the on-chain portion, obviously there's different intents that a user wants to take, right? Whether, you know, Wire covers the deposit and withdrawal portion um, or buy, if you want to call it, or pay, but, uh, you know, Uniswap and Kyber or other teams are able to do exchange and, you know, make current compound, can lend or borrow. Uh, so, you know, there's... It really takes a village for us to all work together on this. Wire is only providing just the on-ramp and off-ramp portion. Everything else kind of goes to, you know, our partners and what we can do together to kind of create a resilient network within this ecosystem to help the world to migrate, you know, from Web two to Web three. So, you know, I this was just an idea that we had on, you know, basically using Wire's API for deposit or withdrawal, uh, and what you can do uh, with a meta, fact, uh, meta proxy factory. Uh, you know, where one, once you go from USD to ETH, let's say, and you go into some sort of proxy contract, you can perform a lot of different on-chain actions there, right? So, so, so then that helps a user 
to basically in one hop complete an intent with just two clicks and a face ID, right? If I'm going from Apple Pay and I uh, you know, approve a transaction for $100 to, to send some ETH into this meta proxy factory to perform some kind of action that I wanted to do, whether that's remittance or whether that's lending or borrowing, whatever it might be, right? You, you can literally use wires API combined with some on-chain commands to, to do so. Yeah, so this was just an idea that we had for what a lot of different teams can do. Um, yeah, and then going forward, as I mentioned, you know, we're very much focused on device-based payments because you know, on the institutional side, I think they are gonna just kind of stick with their wire transfers and old school way of doing things. Uh, you're never gonna do a million dollar OTC trade uh, and, and do the settlement on a card. That's just not gonna happen for th these different institutions. Uh, you know, they're always gonna be uh, using some kind of RFQ-based API in the closed loop systems to execute liquidity and trade. Uh, and, and that's a whole nother gambit on how to, you know, onboard the next 100 million users. I, I think it's a top-down approach, you know, you're going through institutions and allowing people to get exposure. But that's really not all that exciting, right? It, it's literally just trading crypto as an asset class and being speculated on. And it's not giving end users the full power of what, uh, you know, what, what all these different on-chain commands can actually do. So, you know, I think going forward, we're very much focused on helping to onboard retail users. Uh, and that's why we're sticking very closely to Apple Pay, Google Pay, and Samsung Pay. Uh, these different native uh, digital wallets have a lot of security benefits. And, and from an onboarding standpoint, it's much easier because it's literally abstracted from, uh, from the end user. You know, they only have to put in their card information one time into Apple, Google, and Samsung. And, and then, you know, they choose to share that with Wire when they authorize a payment. And, and this basically, uh, you know, it, it creates an onboarding experience that is fully abstracted, right? And rather than having to create a payment form or an onboarding page, you know, with three to seven pages of, you know, name, date of birth, address, blood type, blood sample, and all these different really painful um, kind of experiences, you can literally go from zero to crypto in 20 seconds. Um, because you know the, the payment method is already saved on the user's phone, um, and you know we're also working on push to debits, which you know with the same kind of card information that we already have from the user uh, through through their uh, native digital wallets on their device, uh, it actually is just a payment token, right? So it's, so it's not all that different than than crypto in the sense that it is a unique token that we're able to push and pull from. Uh, yeah, so, so you know, if we can pull money from a user's Apple Pay to perform some on-chain um, act actions, then we can equally go from that on-chain action to a user's debit card all around the world and, and to be able to submit, or it, it, to be able to uh, support these different use cases for remittance or any kind of off-ramps that you might use for anything else. Um, and that's it. Yeah, sorry for... Uh, rambling there a little bit. I think we have 10 minutes to answer any questions. Awesome. Okay, should I go to the question here? Okay, why is cool? When will you add more countries, more payment options, and remove KYC ML on small, medium transactions? Yeah, so we actually already uh, done that. So we wrote out with International um, a few weeks ago. Basically, what happened was we signed with a new processor that gives us literally every payment method under the sun. So you know, SEPA or so forth, Bank ID or faster payments or you know, Chas in Hong Kong interact. Um, we are rolling this out slowly because even though we have every payment method under the sun, it's really a function of local compliance. You can't just say, oh, cool, I will use Stripe against, uh, you know, let's say Coinbase or Binance API, and I will just send crypto to users. Well, that's not compliant because the crypto settlement, depending on the jurisdiction, is seen as money transmission. So, so yeah, so we're constantly working on basically rolling out new countries, and also, you know, removing the KYC and AML, or at least abstracting it, right? As I mentioned, going from uh, Apple, Google, and Samsung Pay, um, the, the KYC AML is abstracted from the end user's experience, at least. Let's see. What tokens are mostly used for payments and remittance through wire? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I think when we first started out doing uh, remittance, we used Bitcoin because that had the deepest liquidity across different exchanges. So we were able to get the best price and execution for our end users. You know, and we, we've been talking to like Ripple and Stellar for the longest time, but you know, it never actually made sense to use XRP or XLM for for remittance because once again, you're still having to go through some kind of crypto exchange locally for for the rebalancing. And the execution. So, so you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum obviously are the biggest in terms of liquidity for us to be able to execute that. In the future, we're hoping to you know go through more decentralized exchanges and have other teams basically build this out themselves, right? So, so long as we provide the on ramp and the off ramp, technically you can use something like a Kyber, you know, for the US to the USDC portion, and then the USDC going somewhere else and then using Wired once again for the off ramp. Uh, but currently, we support USDC, DAI, ETH, and BTC. We don't support other tokens, at least not natively within you know within the wire trans within a wires transfer API. We can only go from USD, Euro, AUD, and GBP to you know BTC, ETH, USDC, and DAI. Um, but once again, if you guys had a proxy contract where you used wire, let's say for USD to ETH. That ETH can be sent to a proxy contract to perform any other function in a non-custodial manner, right? And that's something that different teams can use it for. Is it possible to build a smart wallet in Mexico with this infrastructure? Actually, yes. So we uh, already have on ramps and off ramps in Mexico through our local partner there, who is uh, licensed uh, with the local government uh, for money transmission, and we are able to. Uh, help different Mexican users with off ramps directly to their bank account for businesses and individuals, as well as on ramps uh, from debit cards and credit cards. Uh, how can DeFi business integrate with Wire? For example, to let users on ramp into DeFi, what countries are supported and how's the KYC process? Cool. Yeah. So right now, uh, the countries we support are US. Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Europe for on ramp. For on ramp, right? on the, the nuance between on ramp and off ramp really depends on the payment network that you use. Right? If you're using cards, if you're using local bank, uh, local bank transfers like SEPA or ACH, right? Versus the card network, it's it's uh, it's a different uh, it's a different infrastructure, right? It's a different payment network. So so in terms of wires payment network. In 2016 and 2017, what we had built out was basically lo using local bank transfers. So, you know, literally we have a bank account in Mexico and then that, it, that we have an exchange account with. So when we off ramp, we're converting some kind of crypto to fiat and then we're using another payment company to help us with the mass payout to businesses and individuals. And all of that has been abstracted into the wire API. You know, once again, where you just pass as a user's source and a desk and their KYC and their payment method. Um, so, so yes, for DeFi businesses, you're able to either use our API or a widget, All right? So uh, I can, let's see, you, you guys can check out uh, all the docs here. But yeah, there's a section for widget, there's a section for API. Uh, we've also brought this into other tools like Zapier and Postman uh, and React. So, you know, it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, how much are fees compared to transferwise? So this depends on the payment method you use, right? So you know something like an ACH costs just a few cents, so we charge like twenty five bips, like zero point two five percent on it. But something like a debit card or credit card, it goes through the card network, and you know they <laughs> charge, frankly, pretty high fees. So right now for us, it's two point nine percent plus thirty cents going from a card, and zero point two five percent going from ACH. Let's see. Um, question. Walking through GitHub, uh, how to partner Sandbox. Okay, yeah, so so Sandbox, you can just go to testwire.com, and then in terms of like, a, let me see if I can get you guys a simple intro here. Yeah, yeah, so, so you can use uh, pay.testwire.com, and you can configure this URL. Uh, and if you go to docs.sandware.com, that's where you'll find all the documentation. Um, but that air table that I just dropped also has some good resources. Just like it's a high level kind of interactive product overview 
what you can do for money in, money out, all right, conversion with exchange. Um, recently, I've actually been talking to some traditional, uh, like traditional banks where I'm trying to get them to use our wallet API for custody so that they can offer their end users a way of buying Bitcoin, kind of like Cash App, where it's in a completely closed loop system. But, but once again, you know, we're working with teams of all sizes from banks to enterprises to you know, hackathon teams and everything in between. So uh, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Definitely reach out to me if you guys are interested. Yeah, push to debit is coming soon. That's right. Um, can we cover users' transaction fees? Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, in, in some cases, it might make sense for a team to pay the transaction fee on behalf of a user because, you know, you're trying to do a promotional or you want to bring them on board and you want to zero out the fees. That's completely fine. Um, you can pay the fees on behalf of the end user. That's very easy for us to either add a markup to a fee or mark it down to zero, you know, maybe like a savings staff or something where, or like, like a savings staff that earns, let's say, 5%. Uh, annually, you don't want the user to pay two percent upfront, so you want to abstract that and then you know make up for it on on the uh, on the AUM that you've captured. Let's see. Do you also have a partnership with Plaid in case integration uh, with such as needed? Uh, yes. So so on our back end, guys, you know Wire works with a lot of different companies, right? So. Um, or, or either by proxy or directly. Plaid is one that we work with directly because you know, in order to establish uh, a payment method on wire for local bank transfers, we need a user to connect through Plaid so that they connect their bank account, right? So then they can do a wire transfer or ACH, or we can push money to their bank, right? That's the, once again, that's the banking network and the banking rails, but we're starting to really move towards the card network because of all the efficiencies that's already gained there, right? So if you if you think about the card network and the TPS and the fact that it's already set up and compatible with every bank and it's all around the world, Visa, Master, right? Like they're not the enemy because we can, it's almost like a Trojan horse where we can use the tech that they already built, stand on their shoulders to help to migrate users from Web two to Web three. So you know if we can leverage those card networks, uh, whether it's Plaid with a bank network or card network, I think. You know, it's, it's something where, you know, at, at least I would argue that for this next five years, when we're trying to transition, you know, from the legacy financial system to to the new kind of uh, purely crypto native, that it, that it would make sense to use. Uh, Jack, I think we're probably at our last question. So if you can just pick one more. Okay, sure. Um, do you support SEPA? Uh, we do, and we also work with partners that do. Conify is one of them. Um, you can check them out. So once again, sometimes Wire offers something directly, but other times they do it through a partner. But all of this has been abstracted into our API. Uh, in in Sepa's case, we can do off ramps there pretty easily. But uh, I do suggest Conify because they're kind of like the Wire of Europe. Uh, very reputable team. AML D5, everything covers super well. You know, when you deal with payments and money and, and compliance, it's really important to, you know, do everything compliantly, right? So on the, everything that has to do with on-ramps and off-ramps, you want to uh, make sure that the partner that you curate is one that uh, operates super compliantly locally. And then obviously once everything's on chain with all the decentralized and non-custodial ways uh, of, uh, of performing different interactions, then that's all good. But the on-ramp and off-ramp portion Really, uh, I would argue that Quantify is the equivalent of Wire in the U.S. in Europe. Awesome! This was really great. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, we're going to transition to our next session now. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Take care.